Section 94 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 94. The Surrender of Rhodes, 1522, by Alphonse Marie Louise de Lamartine. Soliman the Magnificent was a most excellent ruler, in that he improved the laws of his country, encouraged literature, and bettered the organization of the army. During his reign, the war began with Hungary which did not come to an end for more than two hundred years. One of the most famous military exploits of Soliman was his siege of the Knights of St. John on the island of Rhodes in 1522. For four months they made a most determined resistance, hoping for aid from some European power. None was given, however, and finally they made an honorable surrender and agreed to withdraw from the island. This the little band did, carrying with them what property could be moved. The Editor The forty thousand peasant Greeks imprisoned for four months, back within the walls of a city which was crumbling about them, and which was going to deliver them to the slavery or to the sword of the Turks, murmured against the pertinacity of the knights, and implored a capitulation which would save at least their lives and their liberty from the vengeance of Solomon. They conspired openly against the oppressors of the island, who gambled the blood of their Greek subjects against a vain corporate honor. They showed each other on the neighboring archipelago and on the coast of Cilicia the Greek cities subjected to the yoke of the Turks, and enjoying under the tolerant dominion their goods, their religion, their usages, their commerce. The Greek party and the party of the knights were at drawn daggers within the walls, while the Turks were assaulting the fortifications. Solomon, informed of all by his Greek spies, resolved to open, at any cost, a broad road to the heart of the city. He accumulated in a single battery forty pieces of the largest caliber, distributed hitherto on different bastions of the place. A continuous fire, vomiting blocks of marble and lead, pulverized and at last leveled a breach inaccessible to the besieged. A torrent of balls and bombs rolled on uninterruptedly through this breach from the heights of the city to the port. The city traversed through and through, could not unite its fragments under this perpetual reign of death. Solomon, to join persuasion to terror, ordered to be hoisted on the 10th of December a white standard upon his tent. The firing ceased. Two Turkish paralysts approached, holding up in their hands a letter decorated with the cipher of the sultan. Conferences were opened, and on the twenty second of december the muezzins called in sign of conquest of islamism the believers to prayer from their lofty steeple on the cathedral of st john converted into a minaret while the turkish music executed fanfares on the summit of the tower of st nicholas Solomon, meanwhile had drawn off the army to some distance from the city to avoid pillage, and to leave the knights and the population of Rhodes time to evacuate honorably, the city defended so heroically. The Siriskier Ahmed Pasha came, in his name, to invite Villa de Lille Adam to conference in his tent. The Grand Master, confident in the word of the victor, attended, accompanied by a knight of each tongue, to be his witness before the entire order. The old warrior awaited long in the open air like a suppliant, exposed to the wind and snow before the tent of Solomon, till the divan, 
at the time in session, should have finished its deliberations. The sultan, informed of his lack of respect to age, to rank, and to misfortune, hastened to send him a kaftan and a police of honor, and to have him introduced into his presence with all the ceremony of sovereign to sovereign. He complimented him upon his courage and his virtue, worthy, he said, of the great warriors of whom he had read in history. He congratulated the Christians on having heroes such as he. If I had servants as valiant as you, added he, I should prize them higher than one of my kingdoms. Villiers de lille Dame wore upon his countenance the grief and humiliation of one vanquished. Console thyself, said the sultan to him. It is the lot of sovereigns and warriors like us to conquer and to lose by turns at the whim of fortune, cities and provinces. He accorded the Grand Master and the knights all the conditions of surety and honor in their retreat, compatible with victory. Lille Dame returned to the city as admired by the vanquisher as by the vanquished. The day following, Solomon dressed as common Ikinji, irregular cavalrymen, and attended only by two pages in the same costume, mounted a horse and came to visit, under guarantee of truce, the city which he was going at last to possess. He entered at the hour of the repast of the knights, the palace of the Grand Master, and the hall wherein these monk warriors messed in common. He asked to see Lille Dame through one of his pages, who spoke Greek. Lille Dame, recognizing the sultan, received him as guest and not as sovereign. The young man and the old man conversed a long time on the terrace of the palace, which commands a view of the city, of the sea, and of Asia Minor, encircled like a garden by the snow-capped mountains of Cilicia. The sultan penetrated with esteem for the hero of Rhodes, proposed to him a longer delay and easier conditions for the evacuation of the island. The Grand Master made him a present of four magnificent cups of gold enriched with topazes, which decorated the treasury of the order. Solomon was affected to tears on contemplating the preparations for eternal exile, the victory and the capitulation imposed upon these aged officers of Rhodes, of whom this island was become the country. It is not without sorrow and shame, said he to his pages in remounting his horse, that I force this venerable Christian to abandon in his gray hairs his home and his possessions. Lille Dame, to hide from the day the shame and tears of his departure, embarked in the night upon the galleys of the order and on the Greek vessels lent by Solomon with five thousand inhabitants of the island, knights or families of the island attached to the order, and who prefer to follow its fortunes to residency in a country subjected thenceforth to Mussulmans. The vessels of Lille tossed about by the wintry waves, wandered from shoal to shoal across the archipelago for twenty-two days before attaining, one by one, the Venetian side of the island of Candia. Elias de Lille Dame debarked here with his colony of exiles, and passing them in review upon the beach, wept with them their lost country. He passed the winter at Candia, in the jealous and cold hospitality of the Venetians. The kings of Europe, indifferent to the decay of this sovereign monastery of warriors, which thenceforth embarrassed rather than served their policy, remained deaf to the complaints of the knights. The king of Spain, more docile to the influences of Rome, accorded them the island of Malta, then arid and unpeopled, as an advanced post, not now against Asia, but against Africa. They carried thither the feudal, monastic, and aristocratic spirit, that obsolete genius of the institution born of other times, of which could have been preserved, but in an island. Lille Dame on landing on his barren rock, without other horizon than the waves between Africa and Spain, regretted bitterly the verdant hills the glades, the purling waters, 
and the majestic prospects of roads. The landed wealth of the order, still intact upon the continent, rebuilt in a few years a city, ports, and powerful arsenals on the rocks of Malta. But the remoteness from the coast of Asia, the idleness, the opulence, the decay of the religious spirit, the licentious morals of a military fraternity who had the rules without the faith of a monastic institution, in fine, ambition, intrigue, national rivalries, depraved rapidly this convent of nobles and soldiers, a posthumous vestige of the Crusades destined to perish by the Christians themselves. The hero of Rhodes, Liladam, already a witness at Malta of this corruption of the institution of which he had illustrated the fall, died of grief rather than old age in contemplating the vices, the disorders, and the insubordination of this military anarchy which fanaticism itself had ceased to sanctify. But the fame and virtues of this great man prolonged the destinies of the order by the immortality of his name. End of section 94「Section 95 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 95. A visit to the wife of Solomon the Magnificent, 16th century, translated from a Genuese letter. When I entered the kiosk in which she lives, I was received by many eunuchs in splendid costume blazing with jewels and carrying scimitars in their hands. They led me to an inner vestibule where I was divested of my cloak and shoes and regaled with refreshments. Presently, an elderly woman, very richly dressed, accompanied by a number of young girls approached me and after the usual salutation informed me that the sultana aseki was ready to see me all the walls of the kiosk in which she lives are covered with the most beautiful persian tiles and the floors are of cedar and sandalwood which gives out the most delicious odour i advanced to an endless row of bending female slaves who stood on either side of my path at the entrance to the apartment in which the sultan's wife condescended to receive me the elderly lady who had accompanied me all the time made me a profound reverence and beckoned to two girls to give me their aid so that i passed into the presence of the sultan's wife leaning upon their shoulders the sultana who is a stout but beautiful young woman sat upon silk cushions striped with silver near a latticed window overlooking the sea numerous slave women blazing with jewels attended upon her holding fans pipes for smoking and many objects of value when we had selected from these the great lady who rose to receive me extended her hand and kissed me on the brow and made me sit at the edge of the divan on which she reclined she asked many questions concerning our country and our religion of which she knew nothing whatever and which i answered as modestly and discreetly as i could i was surprised to notice when i had finished my narrative that the room was full of women who impelled by curiosity had come to see me and to hear what i had to say the sultana now entertained me with an exhibition of dancing girls and music which was very delectable when the dancing and music were over refreshments were served upon trays of solid gold sparkling with jewels as it was growing late and i felt afraid to remain longer lest i should vex her highness i made a motion of rising to leave she immediately clapped her hands and several slaves came forward in obedience to her whispered commands carrying trays heaped up with beautiful stuffs and some silver articles of fine workmanship which the princess pressed me to accept after the usual salutations the old woman who first escorted me into the imperial presence conducted me out and i was led from the room in precisely the same manner in which i had entered it down to the foot of the staircase where my own attendants awaited me. End of section 95. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 96 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 96. Dining with the Sultana, 1718. By Lady Mary Wortley Montague. I was led into a large room with a sofa, the whole length of it, adorned with white marble pillars, like a rule, covered with pale blue figured velvet, on a silver ground, with cushions of the same, where I was desired to repose till the Sultana appeared who had contrived this manner of reception to avoid rising up at my entrance though she made me an inclination of her head when i rose up to her i was very glad to observe a lady that had been distinguished by the favour of an emperor to whom beauties were every day presented from all parts of the world but she did not seem to me to have ever been half so beautiful as the fair fatima i saw at adrianople though she had the remains of a fine face more decayed by sorrow than by time but her dress was something so surprisingly rich i cannot forbear describing it to you she wore a vest called donalma and which differs from a caftan by longer sleeves and folding over at the bottom it was of purple cloth straight to her shape and thick set on each side down to her feet and round the sleeves with pearls of the best water of the same size as their buttons commonly are you must not suppose i mean as large as those of my lord but about the bigness of a pea and to these buttons large loops of diamonds in the form of these gold loops so common upon birthday coats this habit was tied at the waist with two large tassels of smaller pearl and round the arms embroidered with large diamonds her shift fastened at the bottom with a great diamond shaped like a lozenge her girdle as broad as the broadest english ribbon entirely covered with diamonds round her neck she wore three chains which reached to her knees one of large pearl at the bottom of which hung a fine coloured emerald as big as a turkey egg another consisting of two hundred emeralds close joined together of the most lively green perfectly matched every one as large as a half crown piece and as thick as three crown pieces and another of small emeralds perfectly round but her earrings eclipsed all the rest there were two diamonds shaped exactly like pears as large as a big hazelnut round her talpok she had four strings of pearls the widest and most perfect in the world least enough to make four necklaces every one as large as the duchess of marlborough's and of the same size fastened with two roses consisting of a large ruby for the middle stone and round them twenty drops of clean diamonds to each beside this her headdress was covered with bodkins of emeralds and diamonds she wore large diamond bracelets and had five rings on her fingers all single diamonds except mr pitt's the largest i ever saw in my life it is for jewellers to compute the value of these things but according to the common estimation of jewels in our part of the world her whole dress must be worth above a hundred thousand pounds sterling this i am very sure of that no european queen has half the quantity and the empress's jewels though very fine would look very mean near hers she gave me a dinner of fifty dishes of meat which after their fashion were placed on the table but one at a time and was extremely tedious but the magnificence of her table answered very well to that of her dress the knives were of gold the halves set with diamonds but the piece of luxury that grieved my eyes was the tablecloth and napkins which were all tiffany embroidered with silks and gold in the finest manner in natural flowers it was with the utmost regret that i made use of these costly napkins as finely wrought as the finest handkerchiefs that ever came out of this country you may be sure that they were entirely spoiled before dinner was over the sherbet which is the liquor they drink at meals was served in china bowls but the covers and salvers were massy gold after dinner water was brought in a gold basin and towels of the same kind as the napkins which i very unwillingly wiped my hands upon 
and coffee was served in china with gold sucos the sultana seemed in very good humor and talked to me with the utmost civility i did not omit this opportunity of learning all that i possibly could of the seraglio which is so entirely unknown among us she never mentioned the sultan without tears in her eyes yet she seemed very fond of the discourse my past happiness said she appears a dream to me yet i cannot forget that i was beloved by the greatest and most lovely of mankind i was chosen from all the rest to make all his campaigns with him i would not survive him if i was not passionately fond of the princess my daughter yet all my tenderness for her was hardly enough to make me preserve my life when i lost him i passed a whole twelvemonth without seeing the light time has softened my despair yet i now pass some days every week in tears devoted to the memory of my sultan there was no affection in these words it was easy to see she was in a deep melancholy though her good humor made her willing to divert me she asked me to walk in her garden and one of her slaves immediately brought her a peliche of rich brocade lined with sables i waited on her into the garden which had nothing in it remarkable but the fountains and from thence she showed me all her apartments in her bedchamber her toilet was displayed consisting of two looking-glasses the frames covered with pearls and her night talpoche set with bodkins of jewels and near it three vests of fine sables every one of which is at least worth a thousand dollars two hundred pounds english money i don't doubt these rich habits were purposely placed in sight but they seemed negligently thrown on the sofa when i took my leave of her i was complimented with perfumes as at the grand vizier's and presented with a very fine embroidered handkerchief her slaves were to the number of thirty besides ten little ones the eldest not above seven years old these were the most beautiful girls i ever saw all richly dressed and i observed that the sultana took a great deal of pleasure in these lovely children which is a vast expense for there was not a handsome girl of that age to be bought under a hundred pounds sterling they wore little garlands of flowers and their own hair braided which was all their headdress but their habits all of gold stuff these served her coffee kneeling brought water when she washed etc it is a great part of the business of the older slaves to take care of these girls to teach them to embroider and serve them as carefully as if they were children of the family End of section 96. This recording is in the public domain. Section 97 of Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Turkey, Part 3 The Sick Man of Europe historical note in modern times the most determined enemy of the ottoman empire has been russia during the last two centuries that country had fought eight wars with turkey and stripped her of much of her european territory in the last two of these wars eighteen fifty three and eighteen seventy seven the turkish empire was only saved by the intervention of other european powers in her favour turkey had conquered and held her provinces by force and by force they were wrested from her weakened grasp in eighteen twenty one the greeks rose against their oppressors and by the aid of european powers threw off the hated yoke Egypt and Syria passed from Turkish control in 1840, and Servia, Romania, and Bulgaria in 1878. The abuses of the Turkish government were innumerable, and finally the Young Turk Party was formed by the more enlightened people of the country. With the first years of the 20th century, its activity increased. The sway of the Sultan abdul hamid the second had long been sustained by bribes spies and murders until the unendurable point had been reached in nineteen o nine he was deposed and his brother placed upon the throne 
In 1912, the Balkan states combined in an attempt to extend their territories at the expense of Turkey. In the war that followed, the Allies were victorious, but the breakdown of the alliance at the close of the war gave Turkey an opportunity to regain part of her European territory, including Adrianople, the ancient capital of the Ottoman Empire. End of section 97 this recording is in the public domain. Section 98 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 98. The Last of the Janissaries. 1826. By Morris Yokai. The Janissaries became more and more savage and lawless, until they were hardly more than a ferocious band of assassins. Several sultans tried their best to reform them, but to no avail. Sultan Mahmud II was determined to reorganize his army on the European plan, but the Janissaries were equally determined that this should not be. They revolted, they burned, and they slaughtered with the most horrible tortures anyone who dared even to mention any change in the organization. The Editor The Sultan was standing on the roof of his palace, whence he could view far away the spreading scarlet glow of the conflagration which lit up the night with a terrifying glare, whose fiery columns were reflected in the black Bosphorus. Panic-stricken fugitives spread the report that the Siraglio itself was in flames, and indeed it looked in the distance as if the fiery waves had reached its cupolaed towers. Mahmud spent the whole night in prayer. Two hours after midnight, a horseman arrived who had forced his way through Stamboul, his good steed collapsing as it reached the cypress grove of Bakishtash. The horseman himself demanded an audience of the sultan and was instantly admitted. A bright momentary ray of hope was visible on the face of Mahmud as he recognized the horseman. It was Tomar, now the Akinji Veriki the bravest warrior in the three continents of the Ottoman Empire. When Mahmud had quitted the Suraglio, he had picked out sixteen young horsemen from amongst his retinue, and left them behind in the palace, with the injunction that if a rebellion should break out in Stamboul, which was pretty certainly to be anticipated, they were to cut their way through the enemy and bring him word thereof. Tomar alone had arrived. The other fifteen had been killed by the rebels. He had cut out a road for himself and contrived to reach Bakishtash. "'The dragon has raised all the twelve heads, my master,' said he to the sultan. "'Now is the time to cut them all off, or it will devour thy empire.' The sultan, who greatly loved the youth, wiped the sweat from his face with his own handkerchief, and bade him await below in the banqueting chamber. And with that, he resumed his devotions. Toward five o'clock, when the sun rose from behind the blue hills of Asia in all its glory, the sultan descended from the roof of his palace and commanded his servants and men-at-arms to form in rank in front of the palace. All the fighting men he had with him were a thousand akinjis, irregular cavalry, and about as many horsemen, silchidars, division of paid cavalry, and Bostanjis, bodyguards. Those who had seen his face but an hour ago were amazed at the change that had come over it. Its generally mild and peaceful expression had given place to a proud resentment and a death-defying audacity. He embraced his wife and the Sultana Aseki, and finally his son, the heir to the throne, not a tear was visible on his face as he embraced his beloved ones. They all noticed a new vigor flashing from his eyes. He looked as if he were inspired, 
he had no need now for any one to encourage him. As he held one arm round his wife and the other round his child, he said to them, And now I go. My path leads me into Stamboul. Whether it will lead me back again I know not, but I swear that if I do return, it will be as the veritable ruler of my realm. What will ye do if I perish? The face of Milieva glowed at this question. She led Mahmoud aside into the back part of the room. There the sultan perceived a large heap of pillows and cushions. If Mahmoud perishes, said the Circassian girl enthusiastically, those who love him will discover a way of following him. Yea, thine enemies, when they look for us, will only find our ashes here. Mahmoud kissed the girl on the forehead. She was indeed worthy to sit at the foot of the throne. With that he descended into the courtyard, and they led his good steed in front of the arched door. The sultan beckoned to Tamar to hold the reins while he mounted. Then he detached an agate from the heron plume that waved above his turban and fastened it on the fez of the youth as he knelt before him. I name thee leader of the Akinjis, and now, whoever has a sword, let him show that he is worthy of our ancestors. With those words, the Padishah drew his scimitar, and galloping to the front of his horsemen, took the place of command. A moment later, the little host was already on its way to Stamboul. In front marched the Akinjis, with glittering bayonets. In the center was the Sultan with his suite. The rear was brought up by the horsemen and the gardeners. Every one of them was resolved to die honorably and gloriously. On reaching the city, the bold band met at first with but little opposition, for they came unawares. The rebels were weary from the exertions of the previous night. After putting out the conflagration, the mob had set to work plundering and towards morning the greater part of it had dispersed among the coffee-houses and other places of amusement. Mahmoud and his aggressive band met with no opposition right up to the Seraglio. The streets indeed were thronged by a noisy mob, but it made way at once before the serried ranks of the Akinjis. None insulted the sultan by so much as an offensive word. On the contrary, Cries of admiration were audible here and there. Men were astounded when they beheld the Padishah appear with a handful of armed men amidst the raging tempest and permitted him to enter the gates of the Seraglio in peace. The shout bursting through all the doors, which resounded for some minutes from the inside of the palace, announced to those outside what courage the appearance of the sultan had instilled into the hearts of those of his warriors who were shut up in the seraglio. Karamakan, full of amazement, withdrew the bulk of the rebels from the Grand Signor's palace and massed the Janissaries near the Etmedin, where banners were hoisted side by side with the subverted kettles. At the corners of the streets the wild priests of Beltash continued to incite the agitated mob with hoarse cries, and from the summits of the minarets the horns of the rebels sounded continuously, only seizing at such times as the imams summoned the people of Osman to glorify Allah about the fifth hour of the day. At the sound of the namazat even the furious popular tempest abated, only beginning again when the last notes of the call to prayer ceased to resound. Stamboul was literally turned upside down, and the dregs were swimming on the surface. The confraternity of porters, the water carriers, the boatmen, all stood by the Janissaries and swelled enormously the bulk of the rebels. Every mosque, every barrack was in their power. Even the towers of the Dardanelles had opened their gates to the Jamaki who were in alliance with the Janissaries. The sultan was shut up in his own palace. 
the janissaries intended to carry the edifice of the sublime porta by assault and had therefore sent forth criers to the jebejis or camp blacksmiths who were encamped with the heavy cannons on the grounds of the mosque of sophia to invite them to begin the siege the emissaries of the janissaries in brief savage harangues called upon the jebejis to put their hands to the bloody work the latter listened to them but for a long time hesitated suddenly a shot fired from amongst the crowd struck one of the speakers who fell down dead whereupon the other jebejis rushed upon the envoys of the janissaries cut them down and flinging their severed heads into a heap shouted long live the sultan and with that they proceeded in front of it and turned their guns against the rebels towards midday amidst strains of martial music the kapudam pasha ibrahim whose nickname was the infernal arrived with four thousand marines and fourteen guns a quarter of an hour later were to be seen in the proximity of the jolly kiosk the overwhelming forces of the grand vizier mohammed who under the protection of the night had got together the hosts of asia which had always been opposed to the janissaries the janissary aga was there too with the Komporajis from tophana the concentrating masses welcomed one another with bloodthirsty greeting it was evident from the faces of the leaders that they were determined not to retreat a step on the path they had taken the last hour of the janissaries or of the ottoman empire had struck and now the gates of the seraglio were thrown open and escorted by the high officers of state and the ulamas the sultan came forth the ulamas the imams and the officers of the army stood in a semicircle round the gate the sultan remained standing on the highest step there he stood in the full regalia of the padishahs holding in one hand the banner of the prophet and in the other a drawn sword what do the rebels desire exclaimed with a loud penetrating voice the sheik ul islam who rise up against allah and against the head of the faith the padishah the chief mufti replied with unction it is written in the koran if the infidels rise against their brethren let them die the death then swear by the banner of the prophet that ye will root out them who have risen up against me the viziers kissed the holy flag and took the oath to defend it to the last drop of their blood and now close the gates commanded the sultan and immediately he sent orders to the warders of all the gates of stamboul to let nobody either out or in one of the opposing hosts was never to leave the city alive long live to the sultan death to the janissaries resounded from fifteen thousand lips in front of the seraglio the sultan would have led his army in person against the rebels but his generals fell down on their knees and implored him in the name of the prophet not to expose his life to danger let him at least give his sword to the grand vizier that he might not soil it in the blood of rebels so the gates were shut the circumstance filled the hearts of the rebels with terror they foresaw that this day would now be followed by another the hand of indulgence of reconciliation now grasped the weapons of war of massacre they all assembled round the etmaidan pulled down the buildings in the street and made barricades of them it's a bad sign for a rebellion when it has to look to its defence the forces of the grand vizier slowly approached amidst the roll of kettle drums the durban aga appeared in front of the barricades of the janissaries with the sanjak e sharif in his hand and summoned the rebels to disperse and return to the allegiance of the sacred banner the rebels drowned his speech in curses and above the curses 
rose the thundering voice of Karamakan, hounding on the fanatical mob against the destroyers of the faith of Osman. Wipe out these new ordinances. Give up the heads of the godless ones who sign their names below the Kati Sharif. To wit, the Janizari Aga, the Grand Vizier, the Chief Mufti, and Nebjib Ifindi. This is what the Ortas companies of the Janizaries demand, and their honest confederates, the Jamaki, the Kayakjis, and the Hamaloks, who remain faithful to the god of the Muslimin. Thrice did the Durban Aga summon the rebels to surrender, and thrice did he receive the same answer. They demanded the heads of the viziers. Mahmud's predecessor had, on a similar request, surrendered the heads of the viziers. Mahmud broke his sword in two above their heads, and, throwing the broken pieces in the dust, exclaimed, Just as I now break in two this sword, and nobody shall weld it together again, so also shall ye be overthrown, and none shall raise you up again. The next moment, the cannons of Ibrahim the Infernal thundered forth their volleys from the Etmeden, the bombs tore through the rickety wooden barriers, and through the breach thus made rushed Hussein Pasha at the head of the Ikinjis, with Tomar Bey by his side. The appearance of the detested new soldiers was greeted by the Janizaries with a furious howl, but the very first moment convinced them that the bayonet was a very much more powerful weapon than the dirk. Tomar Bey headed the charge in person, making a way for himself with his bayonet and clearing the ranks of the insurgents like a sharp wedge. On this side there was no deliverance, so now, with the fury of despair, the insurgents flung themselves on the guns of Ibrahim Pasha, three times charging his death-vomiting batteries and thrice recoiling, leaving the ground covered with their corpses the terrible grape-shot mowing them down in heaps. It was all, all over. The flower of Bek Pasha's garden vanquished, humbled by the new soldiers, fled for refuge to the huge quadrangular barracks which occupied the ground at the rear of the Etmedan. Karamakan did not live to experience that hour of humiliation a cannonball took off his head so cleanly that his body could only be identified by his girdle. Within the walls of the barracks, the Janizaries made ready for their last desperate combat. It was now late. Ibrahim the Infernal began to bombard the barracks with red hot bullets, and within an hour's time, the whole of the enormous building was in flames. Those who were inside the gates remained there, for there, they were doomed to perish together. Amidst the roaring of the flames, their death cries were audible, but the flames grew stronger every moment, and the cry of their mortal anguish waxed fainter. The generals stood around the building, and tears glittered in more eyes than one. After all, it had been a valiant host. Had been. Those words explain their doom. On that day, twenty thousand Janizaries fell by the command of the Padishah. Those whom the bullet and the sword did not reach perished by the axe and the bowstring. Their bodies were given to the Bosphorus, and for a long time afterwards the billows of distant seas cast their headless trunks on the shores of countries far away. These were the flowers of the Begtash. And so the name of the Janizaries was blotted out of the annals of Ottoman history. The wearing of their uniforms and their insignia was forbidden under sentence of death. Their barracks were leveled with the ground, their banners were torn to bits, their kettles were smashed to pieces, their memory was made accursed. The order of the priests of Begtash was abolished, forever. Their religious homes were destroyed, their possessions confiscated. Thus came to an end a soldiery which had existed for centuries, 
which the wise chandelary founded and which had won so many glorious triumphs for the ottoman arms it was now unlawful to mention its very name end of section 98section ninety nine of russia austria-hungary the balkan states and turkey read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone the muezzin by jean leon jerome french artist eighteen twenty four to nineteen o four painting page five hundred and twenty eight far above the sleeping city whose domes and flat roofs indicate it to be in the east is the richness of the midnight sky its quiet intensified by the silence of the burning stars straight athwart the heavens rises the minaret of a mosque and on the little platform at the top stands the muezzin his business is seven times a day to give the call for prayers at dawn noon four in the afternoon sunset and nightfall and twice during the night he must cry aloud allah is great there is no god but allah mohammed is the prophet of allah come to prayers come to salvation there is no god but allah one of the sects adds before the early morning call prayers are better than sleep the work of the muezzin brings generous reward for he who performs well its duties has made sure of his admission into paradise of the muezzin pierre lotti says now they are beginning their chanting call those voices for which they wait men who dwell in the tops of these shafts lost in the high luminous haze hosts of the air near neighbours it might seem to the moon to-night suddenly break into song like birds in a sort of thrilling rapture that has come over them these men have been chosen for their rare gifts of voice or they could not be heard from the summit of those prodigious towers not a sound is lost not a word of what they chant fails to come down to us clear fluent and articulate end of section ninety nine this recording is in the public domain Section 100 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 100 the house of fear nineteen hundred and eight by francis mcculloch the sultan abdul hamid who was deposed in nineteen hundred and nine lived in constant dread of assassination this will account for the peculiarities of the house of fear the editor as for the sultan's residence the kuchuk mabine or little harem it is a medium-sized two-storied modern wooden bungalow of no architectural distinction whatever rather smaller than the q palace it contains far more rooms and passages the lower windows are protected by light iron bars the upper not but in this respect the little mabine is no different from any of the other kiosks the house contains about a dozen rooms distributed in a haphazard way and not made as in european houses to correspond with the windows this lack of arrangement was it is said due to abdul hamid himself who took a keen though unenlightened interest in his 
numerous building operations the object being to mislead the would-be assassin for whom the ex-sultan has been waiting for the last thirty years if that assassin were so foolish as to imagine that he could judge of the distribution of the apartments from the arrangement of the windows this then was the house of fear a house of fear for the ruled but infinitely more the house of fear of the ruler many exaggerations have been indulged in at the expense of abdul hamid but on the score of his timidity it would be difficult to exaggerate his house is a standing monument to the greatness of his cowardice and the littleness of his mind accident tradition fashion family influence public opinion lack of means or of inclination to express oneself in stone and mortar generally bring it to pass that a man's individuality cannot always be accurately gauged from the architecture of his house or the arrangement of his rooms the possessor of ducal halls may have the mind of a costermonger and a lodger in an attic may have the mind of a king but in the case of abdul hamid most of the influences whereof i have just spoken did not act in one way even tradition was unexpectedly weak as is shown by the very slight attention which the ex-sultan paid to islamic customs in the architecture and in the furnishing of his residence but tradition forced the sultan to build and to continue building in the first place there was the roman tradition inherited by the osmanli which makes building the work of kings in the second place there was the traditional oriental superstition that the more a man builds the longer he will live moreover the necessity for seclusion in the case of a man like abdul hamid made the erection of new palaces advisable hence abdul hamid built and as he was wealthy he could make his palace an accurate representation of his own mind could knead it like clay in his hands could tumble down rebuild and alter as much as he liked just as a painter might efface line after line until he had got exactly what he wanted without fear of encountering the faintest opposition from any quarter the result was an architectural horror such as the world never saw before not even in the days of decaying rome for diocletian's villa is even yet beautiful and imposing the wilderness of ugly kiosks pavilions chalets and belvedere which go under the general name of yildiz has no master thought no dominant inspiration unless it be fear everything in yildiz bears the imprint of the curious and crooked mind which called it into existence safety from pursuit and assassination seems to have been the main object in view it is not a palace said one of the deputies who took part in the examination of it it is a labyrinth it has the air of having been constructed with the unique object of rendering pursuit along the corridors impossible no one can imagine the sultan's residence without coming to the conclusion that it was the production and the abode of fear unutterable like the caligula and Domitian described for us by suetonius abdul hamid was almost insane fundamentally indeed he was neither a caligula nor a Domitian, but he curiously resembled the latter in his suspiciousness his elaborate precautions against assassination and his intense dread of conspiracies directed against his life to guard against conspirators getting a plan of his residence he was continually changing its internal arrangements walling up doors opening new ones narrowing passages dividing by partitions making windows and closing them again the iron door which communicated with the garden was of great strength and was capable of being very firmly bolted inside to spare himself the danger of crossing the gravel path which separated his house from the harem the sultan had linked his residence by flying bridges to the harem on the one side and to the imperial theatre on the other his front door which faced the harem opened in the side of a small projecting pseudo porch of a kind common in cheap suburban cottages in london opposite that undignified entrance was the reception room which i shall describe later wherein abdul hamid received the news of his deposition next the reception room was a small bare sitting-room with one window looking towards the harem and in the centre a table whereon stood at the time i visited yildiz a bottle of medicine bearing the vague direction take a glass from time to time and a second bottle containing some kind of liqueur 
from this ill-lighted apartment a narrow passage led to the room which happened to be abdul hamid's bedchamber on the last night that he slept at yildiz it was a very small and plainly furnished room with one window looking out on the great harem and with a plush sofa bed near the opposite wall on the occasion of my visit this sofa bed was in exactly the condition in which abdul hamid had left it tossed and tumbled about on the couch were a soft turkish quilt such as a draper would describe as rich satin quilt filled with pure down and some half dozen soft silk cushions over a long chair near by hung a white night-dress and a cincture bearing the letter a both belonging probably to abdurrahmin effendi the sultan's favourite son who was continually with his father during their last few days in yildiz near the sultan's bed was a little rest for a coffee-cup or more probably for a revolver in a recess cut into the wall in a corner of the room was a washstand and basin hidden by a lacquer screen on the wall above the couch hung a large japanese kakamono bearing the figure of a bird i think an eagle abdul hamid's study was like his bedroom on the ground floor and looked out on the garden this was the workshop of what was probably one of the hardest working monarchs that ever lived but when i visited the place a few months after its owner's departure there remained little trace of that stupendous and misdirected industry for abdul hamid had dealt largely with living documents and had never been a bookish man and all his papers had been carted away long before to the saraskirat the legs of the table and of the chair in front of it were scientifically insulated the sultan having evidently been afraid of lightning ever since an occasion when yildiz was struck by it on the table were some copies of the fatal sir besti newspaper which had played such a role at the time of the mutiny also an old report from the turkish embassy in london regarding the indignation meetings provoked by the armenian massacres it is well known that like peter the great prince nikolai andreyitch and other famous historical and imaginary characters abdul hamid was an enthusiastic carpenter and upstairs the most remarkable room in his palace was a carpenter's workshop fitted with all the necessary appliances and tools the latter to judge from their discoloured handles must have been often used the sultan seems to have been fond of inlaid work preferring generally an inlay of various coloured woods also of pearl and some five or six panels in his study are said to be his work they look like it says an expert who has examined them the drawing is bad and the mixture of coloured woods quite vulgar the workmanship however is neat and accurate what struck one about all the rooms and particularly about this carpenter's room was their small size their owner seemed to require little more space than a cat and was evidently not a monarch who delighted in striding up and down lofty halls there were only two large rooms in the palace but abdul hamid seldom entered them near the carpenter's shop was the bathroom where the padishah is said to have often taken milk baths and to have elaborately made up for his public appearances by means of paints and dyes it was a comparatively large apartment the walls were covered with white glazed tiles and the cupboards filled with hair restorers complexion restorers patent medicines and quack remedies guaranteed to rejuvenate the most senile a calendar in the bathroom bore the date april fifteenth the day the macedonians began their march in a glass cabinet in one of the rooms upstairs was a collection of gold-mounted revolvers and automatic pistols rapiers and rifles evidently presents downstairs there was also a collection of revolvers not gold-mounted these weapons were not merely for show as it is well known that the sultan constantly practised with them and was a very good shot in the garden he fitted up a rifle range with moving figures there were in one of the rooms two stiff padded waistcoats which stood upright of themselves and which were said to contain the famous coats of armour which the sultan used but they were of light weight and i am doubtful if either of them would have stopped a mauser pistol bullet at close range one of these vests was covered with silk and the padishah wore it under the impression that it would also protect him against lightning the windows were not properly painted there was a large hole in one of the carpets and the furniture was at once extraordinarily incongruous and extraordinarily abundant sometimes in one and the same room you had imitation louis sixteen empire japanese art nouveau and several other styles the only thing you had not was the old turkish style despite all his efforts to pose as the religious chief of islam abdul hamid furnished his house 
in what he conceived to be european fashion and as he was after all little more than an ignorant peasant the whole effect was tasteless and vulgar i have said that the furniture was extraordinarily abundant so numerous indeed were the presses wardrobes chests of drawers cupboards and unsightly old bedsteads which filled the rooms and lined some of the corridors that the place looked like an auctioneer's showroom or like a depot used for the storage of a miscellaneous collection of furniture seized for debt from people in different walks of life and with widely divergent tastes like everything else in yildiz this array of old furniture in the corridors had a meaning it meant that the padishah fearing that these particular corridors were not sufficiently narrow had determined to narrow them in this way sometimes he attained the same object by moving the walls more closely together his aim being to prevent two or more assassins from coming abreast into his presence of one man at a time he was not apparently afraid for as the bullet holes in the bull's eyes and movable man-shaped targets in his private revolver range indicated he was a very good shot and besides the revolver which he continually carried in his breast pocket he always had numbers of loaded pistols and revolvers lying within reach of his hand when the macedonians entered yildiz they found loaded firearms lying about almost everywhere in the bathroom cupboards at the bedsides and on the writing tables in the sultan's residence alone over one thousand revolvers were discovered the presses and wardrobes contained such incredible quantities of cheap shirts collars socks and underclothing that the place seemed to be a popular drapery establishment instead of a palace and this impression was borne out by the dusty piles of large corded packages done up in brown paper which were heaped on top of the wardrobes in some of the passages in one room there were more than a thousand collars and shirts many fezes hundreds of neckties and an enormous quantity of writing paper but not a single night-dress there were also two thousand waistcoats all of them evidently intended for the sultan but none of them ever worn by him and over twenty thousand keys like all half savage natures abdul hamid seemed to be very fond of fancy clocks for he had an incredibly large collection most of them gilt productions of american manufacture the fireproof safe in which the sultan kept his papers was very large and modern it was fitted into the wall of the study not far from the imperial bedroom the outer steel doors were large enough to admit the entrance of several men at once inside these were two large safes and many smaller drawer-like safes arranged in rows in the steel walls the whole was lighted by electricity and reminded one of a safe deposit vault in a bank sometimes one felt inclined to conclude that the house had been furnished with presents books and samples of furniture etc sent by foreign firms and foreign potentates most of the books were german and dealt with war with the german army and with turkish history and geography which means that german authors and publishers sent more free copies to the sultan than did the authors and publishers of other nations there were also however many recently published books on turkey in english and french among them were some well-bound trade catalogues which the sultan's librarian had probably regarded as serious literature and some pro-turkish treatises with the turkophile passages heavily underlined evidently by the gifted author one very large and magnificently bound volume which was not kept in a bookcase however but on a table in one of the upstairs rooms was a present from the czar of russia of whose coronation it gave a minute account accompanied by many gorgeous illustrations judging from the appearance of this work and from the inscriptions it bore i should think that only a few copies of it had been specially printed in moscow for distribution among crowned heads and rulers of states another costly present which stood on a bracket in the same room a large room situated above the reception-room was a photograph of the imperial family of germany in a frame which sparkled with precious stones this was a present from william the second to abdul hamid on the occasion of the twenty-fifth anniversary of the latter's accession to the throne on a table stood a clock encrusted with fine stones the gift of the czar of russia there were also of course portfolios and photo albums filled with photographs of crowned heads and imperial princes but i could see nothing in the shape of a present from st james's or from the white house the other large room upstairs was a state bedchamber containing an elaborate double bed of the usual frigid and magnificent kind which one sees in european palaces that is with a canopy curtains the imperial arms above the pillow etc close by were a lavabo 
and several armchairs while on a table at the foot of the bed lay a menu dated may twenty five thirteen twenty four of the turkish calendar that is fourteen months previously every room in the palace was provided with a sofa whereon the sultan could sleep if he felt inclined but nobody ever knew in what room he would sleep on any given night before retiring to rest he would sometimes call his attendants and say to them keep a good lookout i am going to sleep to-night in this room after which he would invariably go and sleep somewhere else it was a decided relief to escape from this monomania of fear into the servants quarter near abdul hamid's last bedchamber in yildiz was the rough bed of a soldier and farther back were small rooms wherein a large number of servants slept on mattresses spread on the floor empty bottles containing the stumps of burnt-down tallow candles and fragments of the exceedingly plain-spoken and broadly humorous literature of old arabia pointed to the fact that some of the soldiers read themselves and the others to sleep while their imperial master was probably lying awake awaiting the coming of that assassin who never came returning to the sultan's part of the house we are surprised by the number of japanese fans and screens which must have been bought by abdul hamid from the local japanese dealer or presented by the latter to the padishah on behalf of the mikado near the outer door stood a large camera the only picture i saw was a most extraordinary performance in oils which looked like the work of a schoolboy but which is said to have been painted by the padishah himself it represented a number of bearded men dressed like french priests and standing in a cake or boat playing musical instruments and singing the cakeji or boatman extends a purse of gold towards the shore on which dance a troop of naked women it is said that a resemblance has been traced between the faces of the men in the boat and those of midhat pasha and the other reformers and that the sultan meant to indicate that constitutionalism would bring in its wake christianity corruption and immorality but that such a hideous daub should have been hung up near the sultan's bedroom is surprising unless on the assumption that the sultan painted it himself the famous garden of yildiz whereon look out the reception-room in which abdul hamid heard of his deposition and the study where he used to sit on an insulated chair consists of about ten acres of park containing some fine old trees well-kept gravel paths imitation and real flowers little arbours provided like every room in the palace with match-boxes and ash-trays for the ex-sultan is a great cigarette smoker and a canal traversed by a little treadmill boat and provided with toy landing stages corresponding to the different landing stages on the bosphorus the garden is a disappointment but there is one very extraordinary feature the high wall which bounds it and which also forms the inner enclosure of yildiz is lined throughout its entire length with the cages of birds and wild animals not small cages but large substantial ones such as are used in regent's park in some of these cages are monkeys and rare dogs but the sultan seemed fondest of all kinds of birds especially harmless birds such as pigeons of which he is said to have possessed twenty thousand specimens not free but confined in huge cages each of which held hundreds of these birds there were also thousands of storks canaries parrots cranes etc even in the outside park there were two zebras two deer several empty cages which had evidently accommodated large wild beasts probably lions or tigers a poultry yard for hens and pheasants cages for parrots a special section for the beautiful angora cats of which the sultan was particularly fond running about at large were a great number of rabbits some sheep three ostriches and several gazelles on the lake paddled a number of magnificent swans the inside enclosure was more like a public menagerie however than a palace park and i must say that an examination of it modified somewhat my opinion of abdul hamid if he had collected all these animals together in order to experiment with and torture them like dr moreau on his island then one could say quite so but this is just what we expected this is exactly in keeping with the rest of his character but the birds and animals had evidently been accustomed to be caressed and fed by a kind master in other words the old sultan evidently liked animals and a man who loves animals cannot be wholly bad End of section one hundred this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and one of russia austria-hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The World's Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 101. The Silent Army. 1909. By Francis McCullough. 1908. The Young Turks, as the Progressive Party is called, rose against Abd ul Hamid and forced him to grant a constitution. A year later, the Sultan contrived to bring about a revolt of the garrison in Constantinople. Then the Macedonians, whose march is here described, came down upon the city, and in ten days the Young Turks' party was in power. Abd ul Hamid was deposed, and his younger brother was set upon the throne as Mohammed V. The Editor At the extremity of the Golden Horn, on the eastern side, lies the old Jewish cemetery, a bare hillside of enormous extent, covered with ancient rough blocks of stone, lying on the ground, not planted in it, and bearing the appearance of having been deposited there, haphazard, by glaciers, and not by the hand of man. Altogether one of the weirdest and most extraordinary sights that even Constantinople can show. At the southern edge of this desolation lives Salih Keremet, a Turkish shepherd. All Turkish peasants are superstitious, and, after more than forty years spent in this lonely spot, the last ten years passed in solitude, for his childless wife died in the year 1899, Salih had become morbidly superstitious. Instead of growing accustomed to the huge adjacent graveyard, he became more and more afraid of it every day, and at night, before retiring to rest, he always looked apprehensively towards the wilderness of tombstones to see if perchance the ghost of the Hebrews buried there were wandering abroad. On the night of Friday, April 23rd, he retired to rest at an early hour, according to his invariable custom and at once fell into a sound sleep, for he had travelled much that day, having been to the Silamlik of the Padishah Abdul Hamid at Yilsik Kiosk, and having also been at the Suleiman Mosque in Stambul to perform his devotions. During the course of the night, at what hour he could not say, for he had no clock or other means of calculating how long he slept, he was suddenly awakened, by the furious barking of his dogs, rising hastily, for he had never heard his dogs bark like that before at night, as belated travellers always give this ill-omened spot the widest possible berth. He threw a robe over his shoulders and opened the door, which, by the way, looked south, that is, in the opposite direction to the cemetery. There was a feeble clouded moon, and by its light he could see that his dogs were gathered together in a panic-stricken group outside his hut, and were barking at something which, to judge by their violent agitation, was evidently advancing on them from the adjacent cemetery. Too horror-stricken to think for a moment of investigating what the something was, Karamet stepped back to shut the door, when suddenly there appeared before his eyes a sight that struck him motionless. A host of phantoms, had enveloped his hut and were rushing towards the city. Hundreds, thousands, passed, not paying any attention to him at all, but fearfully intent on some distant goal. He could not see their faces, a mercy for which he fervently thanked Allah and the Prophet. He could not hear their footsteps, though they passed at a distance of only a few yards. It was this latter circumstance that horrified him most, for he knew that no living men could pass so near without making themselves heard. Had he not remarked, at the Selimlik, that very day, how the giants of the imperial guard made the ground shake beneath their measured tread? Ghosts they certainly were, 
but not praise be to allah the ghost of hebrews on the contrary they were the wraiths of moslem warriors for did he not see the moonlight glitter on their bayonets and on the gilt verses of the koran embroidered on their raven banners the silence of the ghostly procession was terrible but its voice was more terrible still and karamet fell on his face and implored allah the merciful the compassionate to save him from the thunderbolts of his wrath when at dawn of day in taxim square the silent army spoke at that moment the vanguard of enver bey's detachment had reached the outskirts of Pera, and long delayed the tempest of god had at length burst on Yildiz. for these were indeed the macedonian soldiers and the noiselessness of their tread was due to the fact that officers and men alike wore the chadik or soft native shoe which is akin in its noiselessness at least to the waraji of the japanese frightfully impressive was that silent and ghostly invasion the only living things to notice it at first however were karamet the bekji or native watchmen who beat on the pavement all night with their long staves in order to frighten off evildoers and several belated travellers who became petrified with horror as they gazed open-mouthed on this awful hallucination this phantom army advancing without footfall or word of command beat of drum or blast of bugle silent as the invading cohorts of black sea fog that steal down the bosphorus in autumn then the dogs noticed it the famous wise dogs of constantinople distressfully they howled all night in a blood-curdling unearthly chorus worthy of a legion of lost souls hark well to that piercing cry for it is the only requiem of the old regime distressfully they howled for if all of them did not see the northerners all smelt them and knew that the strangers had seized the city for stamboul now has new masters slim clean-built men slavs in arnaouts most of them with the springy step the bright eye and the cheerful laugh of the serb and albanian mountaineer the day of the squat dreamy fanatical anatolian is past the day of the keen and energetic macedonian has come and with it has come a new era in the history of constantinople at daybreak when the silent army suddenly woke the city with a mighty voice the voice of mauser and maxim and krupp the dogs the famous wise dogs of constantinople suddenly changed their tactics and became silent as the grave at the corner of taxim barracks where the fighting was fiercest there was a heap of sand collected there in connection with some building operations and into this the taxim dogs burrowed like rabbits until the bullets ceased to fly they could not run away for every dog in constantinople has its own beat outside of which it cannot venture without running the risk of being torn to pieces by the confrere whose territory it invades for some days after the fighting had ceased these dogs had disappeared from the streets and i sometimes wondered what had become of them had they like yildiz been swept away forever by that whirlwind from the north or were they biding their time consoling themselves in the mean while with the reflection that their father saw a dozen such brilliant reformative movements come to naught that they or their posterity would yet enjoy the sun stretched at full length in the grass-grown streets of stamboul and along the deserted quays of the golden horn in the former case constantinople will cease to be a turkish city if there be any truth in the strange old mohammedan prophecy to which i very often heard reference made during those critical days that when the street dogs of constantinople leave the city stamboul will no longer be mohammedan in constantinople 
they will stay as long as the mohammedans rule the city under the new administration they must go along with all the other relics of the old state of things but it by no means follows that the turks will go with them the prophecy merely says that constantinople will cease to be exclusively turkish and moslem but what with christians in the cabinet christians in the army and with the declaration of the young turks that there must henceforth be equality for all races and religions within the empire stamboul has now ceased to be exclusively turkish and moslem end of section one hundred and one this recording is in the public domain Section 102 of Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Turkey, Part 4 Turkish Stories. Historical Note The early literature of the Turks was modeled upon the Persian. At least one poem of the days before the 16th century has enjoyed fame, for on public occasions every year for nearly 500 years it has been read aloud. Its subject is the birth of Mohammed. After the middle of the 16th century, poetry still followed Persian models, but prose began to imitate the work of Arabia. Much storytelling came into this period, and often the stories are arranged in cycles or cluster about some one person, as in the case of Nazardin Hoja. Fairy tales also flourished. After the Crimean War, the tendency to follow French models prevailed. End of section 102. This recording is in the public domain. Section 103 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The World Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 103. The Lamb Bolted, A Legend of Turkish Justice A customer one day brought to the baker of an inland town a fatted lamb, which he told him had been fattening up for months, and which he wished him to bake in his oven with the utmost care. The baker took the lamb and baked it, and as he was taking it out of the oven, the cadi, or judge of the place, a man of great authority who was dreaded for his sternness, happening to be passing by, smelt the delicious smell of the lamb, and ordered the baker to send it to his house. Effendi, says the baker, the lamb is not mine. It belongs to a customer who has been fattening it for months. Don't eat dirt, says the cadi, but do as I tell you, or it will be the worse for you. The poor baker, in fear and trembling, asks, And what must I say to my customer when he comes for the lamb? Tell him, says the cadi, that the lamb bolted, and if he is obstreperous, bring the matter to my court, and I'll protect you. What could the poor baker do but obey? So he sends the lamb to the cadi's house. Shortly after, the customer calls and asks for his lamb. The lamb bolted, says the baker. How can the lamb I killed yesterday bolt? Are you mad? asks the customer. I tell you it bolted, the baker insists. Upon which a violent quarrel begins, and the exasperated customer, who all the time is holding his little baby with his left arm, takes up one of the logs used for burning in the oven to strike the baker. The latter takes up another to defend himself. Between the furious attack and the defense, one of the logs falls violently on the poor baby's head and crushes his skull. The customer yells out, He has murdered my child! A crowd gathers, and infuriated by the sight of the mangled baby, rush towards the baker to wreak vengeance upon him. He, in a state of terror, flies away and takes refuge in the mosque. The crowd follows him into the mosque, regardless of its being a sanctuary and the poor baker runs up to the summit of the minaret. But the crowd will not be denied, and rushes after him even there, and the baker at last, in despair, sooner than be torn to pieces by the infuriated mob, leaps down from the top of the minaret, and, as it happens, falls on a poor camel driver, who is quietly eating a melon under the minaret with his brother. The camel driver is absolutely squashed and killed on the spot, but the baker gets off unharmed. The brother begins yelling, 
"'My brother is murdered! Vengeance on the murderer!' The mob, infuriated still further, and in increased numbers, comes on the scene again, yelling for vengeance. But the baker, outstripping it, finally finds his way to the Cadi's court, which is open. When the Cadi sees the baker and the excited crowd following, he orders the police to shut the doors of the court and to inform the people that only plaintiffs and defendants will be admitted and that justice will be done. The lamb owner first presents himself, with his mangled baby still in his arms, and he apostrophizes the judge thus. "'Justice! I demand justice, my lord. This baker began by stealing my lamb, and then, with a log of wood, killed my baby. Here it is. And weeping copiously and loudly, he shows the baby. "'What have you to say to this charge?' asks the Cadi sternly of the baker. "'My lord, it was an accident,' says he. "'Ah,' says the Cadi, "'the case is a very serious one, and I must consult our holy law.' So he retires into the inner chamber, and after a long delay, sufficient for two good pipes, purposely conceived to weary the crowd of waiting folk, he returns into the court, and says, "'The court has judged. Hearken, ye people.' The judgment is that inasmuch as our holy law in such matters requires an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the nearest approach to justice in this difficult case is that the plaintiff should divorce his wife forthwith. This can easily be done by the husband's pronouncing three words, and give her to the baker in marriage, and that the baker should give the first child of this marriage into the hands of the plaintiff to take the place of the deceased baby. Hearing this judgment, the plaintiff, who loved his wife and did not want to part with her, said, my lord, I repent. I withdraw the charges. The Cadi, after reprimanding him indignantly for his inconsistency, condemns him to pay costs, and acquits the baker. Then came the turn of the camel driver's brother. He addresses the judge thus. Justice, my lord. I demand justice. This man jumped on my brother from the top of the minaret, whilst we were eating a melon peacefully together, and squashed him to death. What have you to say to this serious charge? The Cadi asks the baker who replies, My lord, how could I from the top of the minaret see the men who were down below it? Why were they there? The Cadi put on a grave face and said, This is a very serious case. I must consult our holy law. So he again retires into the inner chamber, and after indulging in a long pipe, returns to the court and says, Hearken ye people to the judgment of the court. Inasmuch as in this case our holy law requires an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the court pronounces the following judgment. That the baker should be made to sit at the foot of the same minaret and eat a melon, and that the plaintiff should go to the top of it and jump down upon him. Upon which the camel driver's brother, who did not relish an eighty-foot jump, says also, My lord, I repent. I withdraw my charge. And the Cadi, expatiating again indignantly on the inconsistency of men, condemns him to costs also. And so the baker got off scot-free, whilst the Cadi got the lamb and the costs from both plaintiffs. End of section 103section 104 of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by tj burns the world story volume 6 russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan Section 104 Stories of Nasruddin Hoja. Nasruddin Hoja was a real character who lived in the 14th and 15th centuries. He was the great wit of the Turks, and they are never weary of telling and retelling his stories. The Editor The Revenge of the Hoja. Having quarreled with villagers whose cowherd he had become, he threatens them with terrible vengeance upon which one of them asks him, What will you do, O Hoja? Will you let our cows stray and become the food of wolves? Worse than that, replies Hoja. Will you set fire to our village? asks the villager again. Much worse than that, he replies. Well, what will you do? Tell us, says the villager. I can tell you, replies the Hoja. I'll work for you for a whole year. And when the time comes for you to pay me my wages, I'll throw the money into your face and go away. The Hoja as a Politician 
and the fellow citizens of the hoja consulting him as to the best man to elect for governor of their town he asked them the following question out of what sphere of life would the dogs choose the man to lead them that of a butcher they replied for they would hope to get scraps of meat out of him go you and do likewise with your governor said the hoja the hoja and the thief the hoja's poverty was so great that there literally was nothing to be found in his hut but the rags he and his wife wore the couple were lying on the floor one night when the wife heard a thief trying to creep in she pushed her husband and said hoja wake there is a thief coming in hush hush whispers the hoja let him come it may please allah to grant him something to steal and then i'll get up and steal it back again the other apple tamerlane the tartar in whose court the hoja lived for some time one day gave him two beautiful apples and a letter to take to his beloved princess on the way he smelled the apples repeatedly and finally unable to resist the temptation he eats one up he presented the remaining apple and the letter to the princess the letter informing her that two apples were sent and in flowery language comparing their fragrancy and bloom to her own she read the letter and seeing only one apple said well hoja where is the other one to which he replied pointing to the apple that's the other one the hoja and the cucumbers when tamerlane conquered akshahir a proclamation was issued that all the inhabitants should bring him tribute he sat on his throne and each person deposited the tribute at the foot of it the hoja had been summoned too and finding after serious consultation with his wife that they had no silver or gold to bring they decided to put twelve young cucumbers into a pretty basket and present them as tribute on the way the hoja being hot and hungry ate five of the cucumbers so there were only seven left he presented these at the foot of the throne and tamerlane seeing cucumbers instead of precious things gets into a violent rage and orders the hoja to have a stroke of the bastinado for each of the cucumbers presented he is thrown down at once on his stomach and the bastinadoing begins notwithstanding the exquisite pain he raises his head strokes his beard and loudly thanks allah tamerlane wondering asked him what are you thanking allah for my lord replies the hoja i was thanking allah that i ate five of the cucumbers on the way and so saved five strokes this reply so tickled tamerlane that he took him into favor and made him his imam or priest how the hoja saved his life the hoja sleeping one night on his terrace hears a thief as he thinks in his yard with bow and arrow in hand he peeps over the wall and sees the thief dressed in white at whom he shoots his arrow and then goes to bed again in the morning he goes to find the dead man but finds instead that he has mistaken his shirt which was hanging up to dry for a robber and had pierced it with the arrow upon which he immediately in his night clothes runs up into the minaret and vigorously intones the psalm of thanksgiving the neighbors disturbed at an early hour and hearing an unusual chant all flock out into the street in night clothes too to see what it all means and seeing the hoja they pitch into him most unmercifully men he says to them wouldn't you thank allah for having saved your lives if i had been in my shirt i was a dead man for the arrow would have gone through my heart end of section 104 this recording is in the public domain recording by tj burns Section 105 of Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria, Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey, 
edited by eva march tappan section one hundred and five a turkish friendship eighteenth century by chelebi yorgaki the following story was told to dr hamlin the well-known american missionary to turkey by chelebi yorgaki to illustrate the fashion in which life moved on in turkey even in the eighteenth century the editor you know the upper gate of the egyptian bazaar well just outside of that in the crowded street my grandfather had a bread shop his name was johannes Jiris, but always known as johannes ekmekgi johannes the bread-seller right opposite was ibrahim tutungi ibrahim the tobacconist they were both old men always on friendly terms although one was a christian the other a moslem each took his son a lad of fourteen or fifteen into his shop the christian boy johannes was my father the turkish boy right opposite ibrahim became his chief friend the two boys moslem and christian were always together when the store would allow and finally each was considered derelict to his faith and race by forming such a close friendship this counsel was disregarded and the two youths had made a vow of eternal friendship the moslem father determined to cut it short for ever although the doing of this would deprive him for ever of seeing again his beloved and only son a moslem will do such a thing one day ibrahim came to johannes and said i have come to bid you good-bye johannes i shan't see you again for a long time wherever you go said johannes i shall go too yes but now you can't my father has made me chibukji to the pasha of baghdad and i'm going right off then they fell upon each other's necks and kissed and wept and separated ibrahim's last words were i shall come back to constantinople and i shall not come back to be ibrahim tutungi nor ibrahim chibukji but ibrahim your friend the young ibrahim rose rapidly in favour with the pasha after a time he promoted him to be a writer in his great office at baghdad and afterwards to be a paid secretary gave him a wife and a house and thus ibrahim while yet a young man had reached a position of honour and influence after a few years he made him his second in office the kurds on the eastern border were often to be chastised and the great and turbulent pashalik required a firm and vigorous hand ibrahim was the man for the place and pasha and sultan were satisfied the next change came from the death of the old pasha ibrahim was appointed in his place and thus the tutungi had become the great pasha of baghdad he now petitioned for leave to visit constantinople but the sultan replied when you leave the kurds will come down stay and keep your pashalik in order so he could not see his old home after a while the pashalik of aleppo in northern syria had become disturbed and one pasha after another had failed to set things to rights at length the sultan said i will send my pasha of baghdad there and accordingly he went and straightened things out immediately again he petitioned for leave to visit stamboul and was as before refused he was finally called home in a most unexpected manner the hunkier emperor literally the blood-letter was angry with his grand vizier and cut off his head the next thing was to call ibrahim to take his place he was hardly installed in the grand vizierate at constantinople when he sent two of his bodyguard with instructions to inquire for johannes Jiris, the bread-seller formerly near the upper gate of the egyptian bazaar if alive to bring him with them if dead to ascertain if he left a family and who and where and bring him exact word the street was a narrow one and all the shops open in front the people were all astounded to see the officers enter the bread-store of johannes are you johannes Jiris? Ekmekji, i am how long have you been here my father and grandfather were here before me then you are the man the grand vizier orders that we take you before him terror and dismay seized him he protested that he had committed no crime he had never been guilty of theft murder robbery or anything else to be arrested for all the people from the shops mussulmans and christians gathered round to testify that johannes was a good and honest man and that his accuser whoever he might be was the criminal we know nothing about it said the officer shut up your shop and come with us it was the arrest of fate poor johannes departed and the terrors of death got hold of him 
he met a neighbor from the thanar the greek quarter two or three miles distant tell my wife and my two little boys what has happened to me i am going to my death the holy virgin help them bad news travelled swiftly the wife tore her hair and garments the neighbors crowded in and added their death wails to the shrieks of the widow johannes arrived at the viseret waited two mortal hours unable to ascertain his accuser or why he had been arrested at length he was called into the august presence throwing himself flat upon his face he protested his innocence and begged for his life and said shed not so much innocent blood for who will care for my wife and children they also will perish get up said the grand vizier i do not want your life i wish to talk with you he rose upon his knees with folded arms not daring to look up after some other questions the grand vizier said to him do you remember ibrahim tutungi he was my greatest friend in my youth but he went away and never returned do you think i am ibrahim tutungi why does your highness make sport of a poor man like me i know that you are his majesty's grand vizier but i am ibrahim tutungi and you are johannes ekmekji and he arose and fell upon his neck and kissed him johannes stepped out of death into life as suddenly as he had experienced the reverse after talking a while ibrahim said time presses come with me do you remember the last words i said to you nearly forty years ago i remember well said johannes you said you should come back to constantinople not ibrahim tutungi nor ibrahim chibukji but ibrahim my friend and so god has wonderfully fulfilled the vizier took him to his treasury gave him an account book saying here is recorded all that is here deposited i hold an exact copy you will take this keep an exact account of all my revenues and disbursements and manage all my financial affairs you are to be my seraph banker remember said johannes that i am only a poor bread-seller give me some humble office and i will serve you faithfully but i cannot be your seraph you are a man of good sense and an honest man replied ibrahim and you can be my banker just as well as to be a bread-seller when you get into any difficulty come directly to me if you send a third person he will be your enemy i shall always be your friend then clapping his hands to call his steward he said to him take my friend here give him a fur robe a persian girdle a seraph's turban a horse ostler chibukji all in the uniform of my department and send him to his home so they arrayed him mounted him and in that style of splendour he issued from the grand vizier's gate once in the street he was looked upon with searching eyes which of the old bankers has the good fortune to get the office recognized by no one all bowed down to do him honour armenians greeks jews turks franks all saluted him with the respect due to his master and to his place of dignity and power for being in constant communication with the first officer of the realm it was often a great political as well as financial office occasionally one would approach the chibukji and ask who is this new seraph new johannes jiris ekmekji god is great he would reply and march on as he reached his home his son yorgaki saw him first and cried out they haven't killed papa here he is mamma all alive the desolated widow saw him dismount at their humble door the caparisoned horse the servants the rich array she fainted at the real or unreal sight and fell upon the floor she soon revived and all sorrow was changed to joy and exultation in which the whole neighbourhood joined but what was he to do with horse and servants in his small and humble home he sent them away for the night and the following day he could have any establishment in the greek quarter pleasing as a story of remarkable friendship between a moslem and a christian youth carried through a long life it illustrates well the changes possible and frequent in life under the old regime in the morning this man went out from his obscure home a poor bread-seller towards noon he went as he supposed to be bowstrung and flung into the bosphorus at night he returned to his home the first christian citizen of the empire end of section one hundred and five this recording is in the public domain section one hundred and six of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey read for LibriVox .org by phone turkey part five stories of turkish life and customs historical note the twenty-five million inhabitants of the turkish empire constitute a remarkable medley of races besides the turks who form only a minority of the population are kurds slavs armenians greeks arabs and jews 
the trade of the country is for the most part in the hands of the last four peoples life in turkey is in many respects exceedingly primitive farming is carried on even on the great estates in so unskilled a fashion that only the fertility of the land makes it possible to raise enough for the wants of the country moreover nearly all the land belongs to the crown or the church and the farmer is handicapped by a taxation that consumes about one-third of his harvest there are a few factories but most of the manufacturing of the land is done in the homes where hand looms are used for weaving and brass and copper are made into various utensils most of the towns contain public schools but little attention is paid to education about half of the inhabitants are of the mohammedan faith end of section 106 this recording is in the public domain Section 107 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. The First Telegraph in Turkey. 1854. By Sir J. William Whittle. During the Crimean War, the first telegraph was established in Turkey. This wonderful invention created the greatest astonishment among the Turks, and great and bitter were the discussions as to whether it was a good or bad thing for humanity. To solve the question, it was at last decided to have a full debate by the ulema, or religious hierarchy, of the province of Smyrna, who were at the time presided over by a very wise old mullah, a judge or master the meeting was held and fierce was the contention half the ulema being liberals opined that the telegraph was a good thing because it quickened communications the other half being conservatives asserted that it could not be a good thing seeing that it was an invention of the devil there seemed to be no way of arriving at a conclusion when it was perceived that their chief the old mullah had not yet expressed an opinion both parties therefore eagerly pressed him for his view on the subject and agreed to abide by his decision the old mullah replied my children the telegraph is a good thing what said the conservatives indignantly do you mean that it is not a work of the devils oh yes replied the old man assuredly it is a work of his but why are you so dull of understanding my children can't you see that if the devil is occupied going up and down the wires with each message sent he will have less time to trouble us mortals on the earth below and all the ulema acknowledge the wisdom of their chief end of section 107 this recording is in the public domain Section 108 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 6, Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 108. Choosing a Wife for the Son. By Lucy M. J. Garnett. If the lady has a son of marriageable age, the selection of a suitable bride for him will afford her considerable occupation. For bachelorhood being held in light esteem among Muslims, the state of matrimony is correspondingly honoured, and early marriages are the rule. Should no maiden among her acquaintance appear to possess all the qualifications she requires in a daughter-in-law, the Hanum looks farther afield. From her friends, 
or from one of the numerous old women who make a living by hawking articles of dress, jewelry, cosmetics, and perfumes, from harem to harem, a class who perform all the backstair intrigue of the East, she will soon procure a list of eligible maidens, and, accompanied by one or two relatives and a professional matchmaker, set out on a tour of inspection. Personal introductions are quite unnecessary under such circumstances. The ladies are at once admitted by the portress and conducted upstairs to an anteroom, where, while being divested of their outdoor gear by another waiting maid, they announce the object of their visit. Informed of this, the lady of the house hastens to receive her visitors with all honor in the drawing-room, while her eldest daughter proceeds to dress and adorn herself with the utmost care in order to make a favorable impression on the viewers. The two mothers, meanwhile, studiously avoiding the subject at issue, exchange conventional compliments until the portiere is raised and the maiden enters the room, becoming at once the cynosure of all eyes. She approaches to kiss, in turn, the hands of all the guests, and then serves them with coffee from the tray with which a slave has followed her into the room. After waiting to remove the empty cups, she salams low and disappears. Meshallah! The visitors, whatever their private opinion may be, are required by custom to exclaim, What a beauty! Your daughter! Hanum Afandi, is like a full moon. What splendid hair she has, and what eyes! And the chief viewer proceeds to expatiate on the excellent qualities and prospects of her son, states the amount of dower he is prepared to settle on his bride, and the sum to be paid to her parents, makes inquiries as to the girl's age and fortune, if any, and finally departs, saying, If it is their kismet, they may become better acquainted. After some half-dozen girls have been thus inspected, the mother returns home to describe them to her husband and son. The selection made, intermediaries are dispatched to the family of the fortunate maiden to settle the preliminaries, and if no hitch occurs... The customary presents are exchanged, and the betrothal concluded. End of section 108. This recording is in the public domain. Read by The Story Girl. Section 109 of Russia, Austria Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The World's Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 109. Protestant Bread. By Cyrus Hamlin, D.D. Natives who became Christians were put out of their guilds, and therefore it became almost impossible for them to find work. Many were reduced to poverty, even to beggary. Dr. Hamlin, the president of Robert College, discovered that when Mahomet II took Constantinople in 1453, the act of capitulation declared that every foreign nation located in that city might have the privilege of establishing a mill and bakery. Americans have never claimed this right, said Dr. Hamlin, and I can therefore claim it. The first step was to obtain the firman, or formal permit, from the government. The Editor There was some curious experience connected with the firman, which so well illustrates the way things go in Constantinople, and in the East generally, that I will narrate it. The government readily promised the firman, and had no opposition occurred, would have given it. 
but one of the great pashas was a very extensive owner of mills and bakeries the mills were all horse mills then and he evidently feared that the small steam mill proposed would grow he knew what usually comes of giving foreigners an entering wedge he had the immense guild also whose interests were one with his the promise of the firman was not performed no government on earth was ever so skilful in putting off a thing as the turkish at length i began to build on the faith of the promise we had not proceeded far before engineers from the port came to examine and take a plan of our works i knew that foretold an interdict and counselled all to shut the gate if they saw an officer approaching by treaty right no one could thus enter without an officer accompanying him from our embassy and i was sure they would not even apply for one but hoped to carry the point irregularly and to arrest and imprison all the men found working one day at noon recess the officer came and dmitri whom he wished first of all to arrest was standing in the street eating bread and olives where is dmitri kalfa said he to dmitri himself i just saw him at the wine shop was the cool reply turn round the corner to your right at the foot of the street the officer soon returned the workmen were all in the attic the students and i were below who is the master workman here i am sir i want the rajah master there is no such man here i arrest you all young men and make Pidos interdict keep to work boys you are students and can't be arrested in this way but these are workmen no sir they are all my students an unwary workman in the attic had in the meantime thrust out his head and the officer saw him ho oh, you skulker you are a workman come down here you will go with me i am one of mr hamlin's scholars was the cool reply you a scholar let me hear you read the man who was a good carpenter and a great wag and belonged to no particular faith turned round found a new testament in armino turkish and began to read appropriate passages the officer was confounded i then put my hand upon his shoulder told him he was violating treaty rights that he could reign on the other side of the wall but i within until he should come in a legal manner and so i led him out and shut the gate he sat down upon a stone and began to soliloquize such an interdict never saw i the master workman is a foreign hodja the workmen are all his students i am breaking the treaty my soul what reply shall i carry back i went out and comforted him and told him to say that if the port should violate the treaty again i should accuse it to the embassy and the american government and as the right was included in the capitulations i should inform other embassies of the act it can enter this establishment again only through our embassy the turkish government had placed itself in a false position it must now apply to the embassy and ignore its oft-repeated promise or it must give the firman it wisely chose the latter and the interdict became the amusement of the village and the chagrin of the pasha and bakers who had instigated it a very slight matter secured a large patronage to the bakery our bread was made a little overweight instead of following the example of the bakers who always made it a little underweight as often as the examiners tried our bread they said mashallah and passed on the people soon learned the fact and the amount of time that they would spend to obtain this bread would exceed in value fourfold the difference of weight they would thus gain the truth is all men like to be treated well in a bargain and do not so much mind the amount we had introduced another improvement attempts had been made to bring into market yeast bread but had failed the bread of the country is universally leavened bread and no one but foreigners knew anything about making bread with hop yeast having first mastered the art of making good hop yeast 
the bread we produced became known as protestant bread and commanded a good sale at an advanced price end of section 109 this recording is in the public domain section 110 of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by devora allen the world story volume 6 russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey edited by eva march tappan Section 110. The Dancing Dervishes by Julia Pardo. The Tekia, convent, is a handsome building with projecting wings, in which the community live very comfortably with their wives and children, and whence, having performed their religious duties, they sally forth to their several avocations in the city, and mingle with their fellow men upon equal terms. The dervishes are forbidden to accumulate wealth in order to enrich either themselves or their convent. The most simple fare, the least costly garments, serve alike for their own use and for that of their families. Industry, temperance, and devotion are their duties, and, as they are at liberty to secede from their self-imposed obligations whenever they see fit to do so, there is no lukewarmness among the community, who find time throughout the whole year to devote many hours to God, even of their most busy days. And, unlike their fellow-citizens, the other Muslims, they throw open the doors of their chapel to strangers, only stipulating that gentlemen shall put off their shoes ere they enter. This chapel, which has been erroneously called a mosque, is an octagon building of moderate size, neatly painted in fresco. The center of the floor is railed off, and the enclosure is sacred to the brotherhood while the outer circle, covered with Indian matting, is appropriated to visitors. A deep gallery runs round six sides of the building, and beneath it, on your left hand as you enter, you remark the lattices through which the Turkish women witness the service. A narrow mat surrounds the circle within the railing, and upon this the brethren kneel during the prayers, while the centre of the floor is so highly polished by the perpetual friction that it resembles a mirror, and the boards are united by nails with heads as large as a shilling to prevent accidents to the feet of the dervishes during their evolutions. A bar of iron descends from the center of the domed roof, to which transverse bars are attached, bearing a vast number of glass lamps of different colors and size, and against many of the pillars, of which I counted four and twenty, supporting the dome, are hung frames, within which are inscribed passages from the prophets. Above the seat of the superior, the name of the founder of the Tekia is written in gold on a black ground, in immense characters. This seat consists of a small carpet, above which is spread a crimson rug, and on this the worthy principal was squatted when we entered, in an ample cloak of Spanish brown, with large hanging sleeves, and his gulaf, or high hat of grey felt, encircled with a green shawl. I pitied him that his back was turned towards the glorious Bosphorus that was distinctly seen through the four large windows at the extremity of the chapel, flashing in the light, with the slender minarets and lordly mosques of Stamboul gleaming out in the distance. One by one, the dervishes entered the chapel, bowing profoundly at the little gate of the enclosure, took their places on the mat, and bending down, reverently kissed the ground, and then, folding their arms meekly on their breasts, remained buried in prayer, with their eyes closed and their bodies swinging slowly to and fro. They were all enveloped in wide cloaks of dark-colored cloth with pendant sleeves, and wore their gulafs, which they retained during the whole of the service. The service commenced with an extemporaneous prayer from the chief priest, to which the attendant dervishes listened with arms folded upon their breasts and their eyes fixed on the ground. At its conclusion, all bowed their foreheads to the earth, and the orchestra struck into one of those peculiarly wild and melancholy Turkish airs which are unlike any other music that I ever heard. Instantly, the full voices of the brethren joined in chorus, and the effect was thrilling. 
Now the sounds died away like the exhausted breath of a departing spirit, and suddenly they swelled once more into a deep and powerful diapason that seemed scarce earthly. A second stillness of about a minute succeeded, when the low, solemn music was resumed, and the dervishes, slowly rising from the earth, followed their superior three times round the enclosure, bowing down twice under the shadow of the name of their founder, suspended above the seat of the high priest. This reverence was performed without removing their folded arms from their breasts, the first time on the side by which they approached, and afterwards on that opposite, which they gained by slowly revolving on the right foot, in such a manner as to prevent their turning their backs towards the inscription. The procession was closed by a second prostration, after which each dervish, having gained his place, cast off his cloak, and such as had walked in woolen slippers withdrew them, and passing solemnly before the chief priest, they commenced their evolutions. The extraordinary ceremony which gives its name to the dancing, or, as they are really and much more appropriately called, the turning dervishes, for nothing can be more utterly unlike dancing than their evolutions, is not without its meaning. The community first pray for pardon of their past sins and the amendment of their future lives, and then, after a silent supplication for strength to work out the change, they figure, by their peculiar and fatiguing movements, their anxiety to shake the dust from their feet and to cast from them all worldly ties. Immediately after passing with a solemn reverence, twice performed, the place of the high priest, who remained standing, the dervishes spread their arms and commenced their revolving motion, the palm of the right hand being held upwards, and that of the left turned down. Their underdresses, for, as I before remarked, they had laid aside their cloaks, consisted of a jacket and petticoat of dark-colored cloth that descended to their feet, the higher order of brethren being clad in green and the others in brown, or a sort of yellowish-gray. About their waists they wore wide girdles, edged with red, to which the right side of the jacket was closely fastened, while the left hung loose. Their petticoats were of immense width, and lay in large plates beneath the girdles, and as the wearers swung round, formed a bell-like appearance. These latter garments, however, are only worn during the ceremony, and are exchanged in summer for white ones of lighter material. The number of those who were on duty, for I know not how else to express it, was nine, seven of them being men, and the remaining two mere boys, the youngest certainly not more than ten years of age. Nine, eleven, and thirteen are the mystic numbers, which, however great the strength of the community, are never exceeded, and the remaining members of the Brotherhood, during the evolutions of their companions, continue engaged in prayer within the enclosure. These on this occasion amounted to about a score, and remained each leaning against a pillar, while the beat of the drum in the gallery marked the time to which the revolving dervishes moved, and the effect was singular to a degree that baffles description. So true and unerring were their motions that, although the space which they occupied was somewhat circumscribed, they never once gained upon each other, and for five minutes they continued twirling round and round, as though impelled by machinery, their pale, passionless countenances perfectly immobile, their heads slightly declined towards the right shoulder, and their inflated garments creating a cold, sharp air in the chapel from the rapidity of their action. At the termination of that period, the name of the prophet occurred in the chant, which had been unintermitted in the gallery, and as they simultaneously paused, and folding their hands upon their breasts, bent down in reverence at the sound, their ample garments wound about them at the sudden check, and gave them, for a moment, the appearance of mummies. An interval of prayer followed, and the same ceremony was performed three times, at the termination of which they all fell prostrate on the earth, when those who had hitherto remained spectators flung their cloaks over them, and the one who knelt on the left of the chief priest rose, and delivered a long prayer, divided into sections, with a rapid and solemn voice, prolonging the last word of each sentence by the utterance of, Ha! 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 
with a rich depth of octave that would not have disgraced Philip's. This prayer was for the great ones of the earth, the magnates of the land, all who were in authority over them, and at each proud name they bowed their heads upon their breasts, until that of the sultan was mentioned, when they once more fell flat upon the ground, to the sound of the most awful howl I ever heard. This outburst from the gallery terminated the labors of the orchestra, and the superior, rising to his knees, while the others continued prostrate, in his turn prayed for a few instants, and then, taking his stand upon the crimson rug, they approached him one by one, and clasping his hand, pressed it to their lips and forehead. When the first had passed, he stationed himself on the right of the superior, and awaited the arrival of the second, who, on reaching him, bestowed on him also the kiss of peace, which he had just proffered to the chief priest, and each in succession performed the same ceremony to all those who had preceded him, which was acknowledged by gently stroking down the beard. This was the final act of the exhibition, and the superior having slowly and silently traversed the enclosure, in five seconds the chapel was empty, and the congregation busied at the portal in reclaiming their boots, shoes, and slippers. End of section 110「Section 111 of Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States and Turkey」read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Ceremony of Dervishes at Scutari by Albert Roblet, French artist, 1851. Painting, page 574. After the Dervishes, overpowered by a religious excitement which can scarcely be imagined, have shouted their last, Allahu, after the furious dance in which they have cast themselves upon the sharp daggers and pointed stilettos with which the walls of the room are decorated then when their exhausted bodies streaming with blood and covered with foam and perspiration are at last quiet then after these violent exercises are over begins the ceremony of the imposition of feet the mussulman priest comes out of an elaborately ornamented little niche before him on skins spread upon the floor are children of all ages lying one beside another with their faces to the floor the priest comes forward and aided by an acolyte he walks slowly the whole length of the line of children planting the broad soles of his naked feet squarely upon them those who submit themselves to this penance are supposed to be healed of whatever illness may be troubling them or to win preservation from future dangers ranged around the room are aged devotees who have not been able to share in the savage exhibition end of section 111 this recording is in the public domain section 112 of russia austria hungary the balkan states and turkey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume 6. Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States, and Turkey. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 112. A Turkish What For? By Demetra Vaka. The next morning I had just finished my morning toilet when a slave came to conduct me to Aishe Hanum from whom she presented me with an indoor veil i arranged it on my hair to show my appreciation of the gift and followed the slave to the floor below where her mistress lived when i entered her apartments i found her kneeling before an easel deep in work as the slave announced me she rose from the ground and came to me with outstretched hand it struck me as curious that she offered to shake hands instead of using the temena the turkish form of salutation since i knew her to be extremely punctilious in the customs of her nation i suppose she did this to make me feel more at home welcome young hanoum she said after kissing me on both cheeks do you paint i asked going toward the easel disguising my surprise at meeting with such disregard of mussulman customs in this orthodox household no not painting just playing 
it is only an impression not a reproduction of one of allah's realities good mussulmans do not believe in reproducing allah's realities yet there stood on the easel a charming pastel even orthodox muslims i saw were not above beating the devil round the stump how very beautiful i exclaimed aishe hanoum you are an artist pray pray young hanoum she protested a little frightened i thought pray do not say such things i am not an artist i only play with the colours let me see some more of your playing i persisted rather reluctantly though wishing to comply with her guest's desires she brought out a large portfolio containing several pastels and water-colours and we sat down on a rug to examine them whether they were well done or not i cannot tell but they were full of life and happiness the curious part was that whenever she painted any outdoor life she painted it from her window and on the canvas first was the window and then through it you saw the landscape as she saw it the more i looked at her work the more enthusiastic i grew you must be very talented i said turning to her it is a pity that you cannot go abroad to study but i have studied many years here that is all very well i said still busy looking at the pictures just the same you ought to go to paris to study what for she asked because i think you have a great deal of talent which unfortunately is wasted in a harem as i spoke i raised my eyes ordinarily i am not a coward though i do run from a mouse but when my eyes met her finely pencilled ones there was a curious look of anger in them that made a shiver go down my back if i have said anything to offend you i said i beg you to forgive me believe me it was my enthusiasm she smiled in a most charming way if she had been angry it had gone quickly by but why do you wish me to go to paris she asked again i don't know i said except that paris is nearer turkey than any other great centre and i feel that you ought to have the advantage of being where you could get all the help possible what for she inquired i began to feel uncomfortable i knew her very little and this was the first time i ever visited a former seraili one who has been an inmate of the imperial palace because i answered lamely when a person has talent she generally goes to paris or to some other great artistic centre what for again insisted the question if i had not been in a harem and in the presence of a woman of whom i was somewhat afraid my answer would have been well if you are foolish enough not to know why what is the use of telling you instead while that exquisite hand was lying on my arm and those big almond-shaped eyes were holding mine i tried to find a way of explaining if you were free to go you could see masterpieces you could study various methods of painting and if it were in you you might become great in turn what for was the calm inquiry she was very beautiful not of the turkish type but of the pure circassian with exquisite lines and a very low musical voice and of all things on this earth i am most susceptible to physical beauty at that particular moment however i should have derived great pleasure if i could have smacked her pretty mouth well i said calmly though i was irritated if you had a great talent and became very famous you would not only have all the money you wanted but glory and admiration <laughs> what for she repeated with inhuman monotony for heaven's sake aishe hanoum i cried i don't know what for but if i could i should like to become famous and have glory and lots of money what for because then i could go all over the world and see everything that is to be seen and meet all sorts of interesting people what for hanoum dudu i cried lapsing into the turkish i had spoken as a child are you trying to make a fool of me or she put her palms forward on the floor and then her head went down and she laughed immoderately i laughed too considerably relieved to have done with her what force she drew me to her as if i were a baby and took me on her lap you would do all these things and travel about like a mailbag because you think it would make you happy don't you yavroom 
she asked. Of course I should be happy. Is this why you ran away from home, to get famous and rich? She was speaking to me precisely as if I were a little bit of a thing and was to be coaxed out of my foolishness. I have neither fame nor riches, I answered, so we need not waste our breath. Sorry, of room, sorry, she said sympathetically. I should have liked you to get both. Then you would see that it would not have made you happy. Happiness is not acquired from satisfied desires. What is happiness, then? I asked. Allah kerim. God only can explain it. But it comes not from what we possess, but from what we let others possess. And no amount of fame would have made me leave my home and go among alien people to learn their ways of doing something which I take great pleasure in doing in my own way. She kissed me twice on the cheek and put me down by her. You are a dear little one, she said. End of section 112 End of The World Story A History of the World in Story, Song and Art Volume 6 Russia, Austria-Hungary, the Balkan States and Turkey Edited by Eva March Tappan